Chancellor. Well, good afternoon. It is fantastic to have all of you join us today, not only those that are here in person, but those that are joining us on the live stream as well. For those that I have not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Charlie Moore. I also go by Tuna, and I'm very honored to have been asked to join the Vanderbilt team as a distinguished visiting professor, having retired after 33 years in the United States Air Force, most recently as the Deputy Commander at U.S. Cyber Command. Today's event represents the first and will be an ongoing series of distinguished speakers here at Vanderbilt University. This series, along with our April Summit and several other yet-to-be-announced endeavors, signifies Vanderbilt's continued and growing commitment to the study of national security issues with a special emphasis on future conflict and emerging threats. This afternoon, as part of that speaker series, I'm extremely excited and honored to have the opportunity to introduce two extraordinary individuals. First is our guest speaker and the former Secretary for the United States Department of Defense, the Honorable Mark T. Esper. Dr. Mark Esper served as the 27th United States Secretary of Defense from 2019 through 2020 after being confirmed in an overwhelming 90 to 8 vote by the U.S. Senate. Secretary Esper went on to successfully lead the department through an unprecedented time in the nation's history, from conflict with Iran, an ongoing military campaign in Afghanistan, and counterterrorist operations in the Middle East and in Africa, to open competition with China and Russia amidst a fundamental shift in the geostrategic environment. Additionally, he served during a period of the greatest civil unrest and political turmoil America has seen in decades including a major recession and the spread of a global pandemic, the likes of which the world had not experienced in over 100 years. As Defense Secretary, Dr. Esper was responsible for ensuring the United States national security, protecting the American people at home and abroad, and advancing the country's interests globally. In what has been described as the impossible job, he led the largest and most complex organization in the world, given its nearly 3 million service members and defense civilians, a $740 billion annual budget, and trillions of dollars of weapons, equipment, and infrastructure located in over 160 countries. Secretary Esper's broad scope of responsibilities ranged from preparing and positioning the Joint Force for Conflict to the research and development of future weapons, concepts, and equipment, as well as defense trade, diplomacy, cybersecurity, health care, hospitals, housings, and schools. Prior to becoming Secretary of Defense, Dr. Esper served as the Secretary of the Army, during which time he launched a renaissance in the service, making sweeping changes to how the U.S. Army manned, trained, equipped, and organized the nation's ground force for the future. Upon his graduation from West Point in 1986, Secretary Esper began his professional career as an active duty Army infantry officer, serving in the U.S. and abroad and in combat during the 1990-91 Gulf War. He went on to earn an MPA at Harvard's JFK School of Government and a PhD at the George Washington University. Dr. Esper later worked in the U.S. Congress, at the Pentagon, and in several prestigious think tanks, commissions, and trade associations across Washington, D.C., all while serving in the Army Reserve and the National Guard. He served for many years as a senior executive in a Fortune 100 American Defense and Technology Company before becoming Secretary of the Army in 2017. Secretary Esper is the recipient of multiple civilian and military awards, currently sits on several public policy and business boards, and is a partner in a large venture capital firm. Now, I am also pleased to announce that at the conclusion of Secretary Esper's prepared remarks, he has graciously agreed to a question and answer session that will be led by the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, Daniel Diermeyer. An internationally renowned political scientist and management scholar, Daniel is the ninth Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Since joining Vanderbilt in 2020, the Chancellor has led an ambitious program of growth and advancement. Under his leadership, the university has successfully launched a record $3.2 billion capital campaign, 
topped the $1 billion mark in research funding for the first time and reaffirmed the university's longstanding commitment to free expression and civil discourse. Before arriving at Vanderbilt, Chancellor Deermeyer served in leadership and faculty roles at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, and at the University of Chicago, where he served as the Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy and subsequently as Provost. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Guggenheim Foundation. He has published five books and more than 100 research articles. Throughout his career, Daniel has been an advisor to governments, nonprofits, and leading companies, mostly in the area of crisis management. Additionally, I have no doubt that he will lead a stimulating and informative conversation with our distinguished guest. And so now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming the 27th United States Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Mark T. Esper. Well, good evening, everybody. The end of history has ended. I recognize this statement and the twist I applied to it predates or is unknown to many of you, so please allow an old Cold Warrior to explain. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, American political scientist Francis Fukuyama wrote that this watershed event marked the end of history. He argued that mankind had reached its ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government had been achieved. Others contended that state-on-state -state intimidation, bullying, and heavy-handed tactics, let alone the use of military force to achieve their goals, was now a thing of the past. That history itself, most dramatically and tragically marked by World Wars I and II, was behind us. History, you see, was over. Well, it appears that Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin didn't get the memo. They didn't read the essay. So history is back, and it has an attitude. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. I, I look forward to our conversation on this topic and the opportunity to answer some of your questions about the world we live in today. But before I continue, though, I'd like to first thank Chancellor Deermeyer for inviting me here this evening, and I look forward to our conversation. Brett Goldstein, wherever he is, his special advisor, uh, for coming up with the idea, and Claudia Berger. Where are you, Claudia? Okay. I probably screwed up your name, so we'll just call you Claudia B. It sounds more cool, right, for making it all happen. And, of course, I want to thank General Charlie Tunamore. Thank you for that generous introduction. And let me also say how great it is to be back in Nashville. I came, uh, first came to this wonderful city in 1987 as a young, single, second lieutenant assigned to the 101st Airborne Division up at Fort Campbell, and left four years later as a married, older captain en route to uh, Georgia and then Italy. I met my wife here, a Tennessee gal no less, on a blind date during the annual Summer Lights Festival in 1988. And I don't think they do the festival anymore, do they? Uh, 34 years, three kids, one war, numerous moves, and three years in the Trump administration later. It's, <laughs> it's still a special memory for me. Uh, she might not feel the same. Oh, but look, great power competition is back. It has been for quite some time. The United States government formally came to this conclusion five years ago in the last administration, the one that I served in, but evidence of its return was all around us and goes back at least two decades. In fact, the seeds of its reemergence were planted three decades ago with the collapse of the USSR and the rise of China in the early 1990s. The Pentagon's 2018 National Defense Strategy was built around this geopolitical fact, and it served as the premise for a new strategic approach that identified China and Russia as America's top competitors. Both countries, the National Defense Strategy said, aimed to challenge international rules and norms, to contest the dominance of the United States and other Western countries as the caretakers of this system, and to undermine liberal democracy, arguing that their forms of government were far more superior and more enduring. This last part is important, as the character of today's great power competition has emerged with the world's autocracies challenging the world's democracies. 
Beijing and Russia are pursuing these ends through a variety of ways and means, militarily, economically, diplomatically, and through information operations. They are also innovating new tactics such as hybrid warfare and gray zone activities and employing old ones like bribery, intimidation, cronyism, and murder. When I became Secretary of Defense in 2019, I made implementation of the NDS, as we call it, my top priority. I also made clear that the People's Republic of China was our pacing threat and that we had to both improve the readiness of the joint force and modernize it if we were to win the future. After all, from 2001 until 2021, while we were heavily engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan, Africa and elsewhere, China built the largest military in the world and Russia spent a lot of money modernizing, modernizing its armed forces, or so we thought. Both went to school on us, though. The PRC's diplomatic and economic muscle, now the second largest GDP in the world, also grew, and later, so did its willingness to use it against us. Russia, separately, grew more belligerent, beginning with its assault on Georgia in 2008, its first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and it was our failure, I believe, to forcefully respond in both instances that would lead to Russia's all-out assault against Ukraine last year. At the same time, cooperation between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping evolved from a collaboration to a partnership to an informal alliance against the West. Recall that at the opening of the Beijing Olympics in February 2022, just weeks before Russia's brutal assault on Ukraine, these two leaders published a 5,300-word communique spelling out their grievances, what they hoped to achieve, and how they would go about doing it, the so-called partnership with no limits. Both China and Russia have clearly become more willing to use outright force and, and intimidation to achieve their goals. Further, these large autocracies are focused most on the smaller, younger democracies who neighbor them. Nobody knows this better than the brave people of Ukraine who today, right now, are fighting for their very lives and existence. And even as Moscow prosecutes this illegal war, it maintains troops in Georgia, Belarus, Moldova, Central, Af Central Africa, Moldova, and elsewhere. In the Indo-Pacific, Beijing employs military might to threaten Taiwan, a nation of 23 million, on a near daily basis. Its Coast Guard intimidates the Philippines and other countries who question Beijing's excessive maritime claims. Its diplomats, diplomats practice wolf warrior diplomacy around the world, and the People's Liberation Army is busy in various strategic locations globally. Both countries use these and other tactics to bring smaller countries to heel, to draw them into their sphere, sphere of influence, if not control, and to force concessions from them. Hegemony is live and well, if you were to ask their neighbors. Stronger, bigger democracies, those that Putin and Xi are unlikely to threaten with military force, will see economic and diplomatic leverage applied against them instead. We have seen Beijing do this to Australia, Korea, Japan, and others, ranging from restrictions on tourism to trimming access to consumer goods and rare earth materials. Moscow has cut off energy to its European neighbors and is now using food as a weapon, threatening the shipment of agricultural products through the Black Sea in order to get their way in other areas. The war in Ukraine, which is now well into its second year, has been both tragic and inspiring. The courage and fortitude of the Ukrainian people to stand up to and beat back a much larger foe has given us hope. Their skill and determination has proven that it's not always the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog that matters. The operational situation on the ground is still unresolved as the Ukraine military makes slow but steady progress. But Kyiv has already imposed multiple strategic failures on the Kremlin. China has largely stood by on the sidelines when it comes to providing material support to Russia. It appears that the No Limits partnership has some limits. Yet what concerns me as much as the future of Ukraine and the plight of its people, however, are two other things. First, from a historical perspective, there is the possibility that great power competition could cross the line into great power conflict something we haven't seen since World War II. If the U.S. and NATO were to become directly involved in Ukraine, then the Rubicon will, be, will have been crossed. And second, while a hot war burns in Europe, a cold war seems to be emerging in Asia. 
This time, however, the United States and its allies would face a full spectrum adversary when it comes to China. China brings economic weight, diplomatic muscle, and other attributes that the Soviet Union could hardly muster. So as most are focused on the war in Europe, it is East Asia that is becoming the epicenter of geopolitical instability in the world. With flashpoints ranging from the Korean Peninsula to the Taiwan Strait, you have the world's largest economies, biggest militaries, most technically advanced economies, and four nuclear weapon states increasingly facing off against one another. Needless to say, conflict in the Western Pacific would have devastating global consequences, even if the fight is just confined to the East China Sea and its contiguous waters. Now, look, we can't control the actions of China and Russia, but we can certainly lead when it comes to our own policies and strategies and commitments. So what do we need to do? Allow me to offer a few basic ideas to prime our discussion this evening. First, the United States must continue to modernize its armed forces, improving both their capability and capacity, and we must achieve overmatch in all domains of warfare, land, air, sea, space, cyber. A strong, capable military will not only deter aggression by others, but will also help buttress our diplomacy and actually help us avoid war. Indeed, Frederick the Great once said, quote, diplomacy without arms is like music without instruments. There always has been and remains a role for academia when it comes to innovating in this space, and I know Vandy is doing just that. Next, we must empower our State Department and build up its toolkit, such as developmental assistance and foreign aid, and make sure that our policies and strategies begin with and emphasize diplomacy. Again, this is another place where academia can generate not just new theories to help us understand the world we face, but practical policies as well on how to deal with the challenges it presents. Third, we must strengthen our alliances and broaden our partnerships around the world, especially the ones with the large Western democracies in Europe and Asia. Building relationships between universities and, and professors in the right countries can be both salutary and complementary to the same. Our extended relationships are America's great asymmetrical advantage, after all, so it is vital that we improve them and leverage them. Fourth, we must improve our collaboration with our partners in all areas, economic, military, diplomatic, information, developmental, and technological, and then work together to advance our mutual aims in an integrated fashion. Fifth, the democracies of the world need to firm up their leadership and participation in all UN bodies and other international organizations, especially those that the Chinese are trying to undermine, so we can defend long-standing international rules and law and norms and continue to craft fair and reasonable ones going forward. Sixth, we must commit to engaging Beijing and Moscow together, speaking and acting with one voice that shows unity, resolve, and determination. Our aim should not be to threaten China or Russia, but to convince them of our fortitude and our seriousness so that they will pursue reasonable policies and approaches as responsible stakeholders in the international system. If we fail to do this, then our adversaries will resist our entreaties, seek to further divide us, and our efforts will suffer. Finally, the United States must lead. We must lead with our values, the same ones that we share with our allies, such as a common belief in universal human rights, respect for basic freedoms like religion, speech, and assembly, and the virtues of democracy. It is these values and others, coupled with the international institutions and rules that support them, that have helped promote peace and prosperity since the end of World War II. Well, I think I've given us all enough to consider and discuss, but for one last call for academia in general and Vanderbilt in particular to get fully involved in these momentous undertakings as much as you can. Dare to grow, right? With that, I'll stop right here so we have sufficient time for Q&A. Thank you all very much, and go Commodores. Thank you. <laughs> Chancellor? Chancellor, I think you're going to join Please, us. Please, thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary, for joining us tonight and for these interesting and thought-provoking remarks. And then uh, a reference to Dare to Grow. What more can we hope for? It's a wonderful <laughs> evening already. So, um, Well, thank you for putting me in front of the Tennessee flag. If somebody snaps a picture, my, 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 my wife will be very happy. <laughs> so, and I'll be happy. So um, lots to talk about, a lot of thought-provoking remarks. And... I have a couple of questions, and then there's a couple of audience questions, so I'm just kind of 
weave them all together. Let me start out with um, one of the things that you that you started out with, which I thought was a really interesting reference to Francis Fukuyama's famous "The End of History." And so, the end of the end of history, or the history, the end of history is history. I figured you knew that one. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it, I think it was a very int very interesting point, and I want to start with that a little bit. So, I think one thing that that this period is really characterized, and I remember this well, so I was still, when I was still young and full of promise, I was back in Berlin in 1989 when the wall came down, and I was actually um, you know, on top of the wall when the Brandenburg Gate opened, and I remember, we all remember, I think, this tremendous moment of optimism mm -hmm. that gave rise to this, to this concept of the end of history. And as you said, uh, that we're now living in a very different world. We're living in a world where conflict and great power conflict has reemerged. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the developments already in the 1990s. One question I have related to that, if we, if we turn back time, which of course we can't, was the West too optimistic? Was this idea that if we only engage Russia and China economically and help them modernize and become wealthier, then they would become naturally part of this new world order. Was that, was that naive? Was that too optimistic? Or was there anything else that the West could have done at this point to be in a better position than they find themselves now? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes, we were too naive and too optimistic. And look, it wasn't for one of trying either. Um, I, I remember the time as well, 89, I actually was out in the field training with 101st when we got news. And at that moment, we actually were uh, at least uh, had the perspective to wonder what would this mean for the military, right? We just lost our biggest foe. And then, of course, a couple years later, the, the, the whole USSR collapsed. But if you were to rewind that clock, you remember this time as well. There was a lot of outreach from the United States to Russia, yep. right? Yeltsin took charge. Uh, we rushed in with assistance, offering this or that. Um, Yeltsin didn't let, I mean, there was a, an, a, an attempted coup against Yeltsin. And then we had a few years, and then ultimately Putin came in. But we, there was a lot of outreach from the United States and the West to Russia to help them. And so when I hear Putin and his other folks in his administration talk about how the West is trying to dismantle this, the Russia and whatnot, it just, it just rings very hollow because I remember those times vividly as well. And the China is just the same. Um, you know, we had the uh, China really opened up. Uh, we went through a tough period with Tiananmen in uh, 88, I think. But really throughout the 90s and certainly in 2001, when the United States of all the countries pushed for Chinese entry into the WTO, the view was... Let's bring them in. Let's, let's introduce these reforms. And economic uh, liberaliza lib liberalization will lead to political liberalization. And they will emerge rightly as well, along the lines of what Francis Fukuyama would say. It's, democracy would be the end. And, um, and we led that. I read about this in my memoir, my, my experience. I was actually at the time working for Senator Fred Thompson mm. from this great state of Tennessee. And uh, Fred was resolute, thinking, we better be careful here. They have other aims, right? And we all know. Deng Xiaoping's famous saying about uh, bide your time, hide your motives, right? So, but look, I, I think we did, a, we were overly optimistic, we were naive, uh, but we also put a lot of effort behind it with both countries. And the fact of the matter is um, leadership in both countries, particularly under Putin and Xi Jinping, are really taking their countries in, 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 in dark directions. And the, the shame of it is, or you know, what we lost was that period of time where we could have, where we should have not dropped our guard and we should have been investing in other things and making sure that while we hope for the best, we prepared for the worst. And I think we let our guard down a little bit in, in that respect. Good. So let's talk a little bit about China. Okay. Um, so I think one, one thing that, um, that uh, people are particularly worried about, I think, is um, the buildup of the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, we now have... Uh, I think the most, one of the most rapid, or maybe the most rapid peacetime buildup in the history. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, there's a question about what people call a near peer competitor, particular with respect to Navy. There is also hypersonic weapons. There's a, there's a, there's a whole question about, um, you know, if, if, how do we think about this from a military point of view, where China is, where the U.S. is. Um, that's, one, that's one direction. I think the other aspect that people have been um, thinking about a lot is uh, the Chinese model, the Chinese economy is in trouble by all standards. I mean, we know we have now the crisis in the Chinese real estate market, very mm -hmm. dramatic. 
Uh, we never really see the takeoff from COVID. We have um, uh, the, the, the crackdown on the tech businesses, and we have also demographic challenges that are very acute. So there's a there's a you know an, an, another piece to this, which together makes a very worrisome combination that uh, the domestic challenges that China now mm -hmm. face may encourage Chinese leadership mm -hmm. to become more aggressive from a national security point of view. What's your assessment of both of these dimensions? Wow, I mean. Uh, do you want the two-minute answer or the 20-minute answer? Uh, so, what, uh, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> uh, look, you're, you're spot on. The lar one of the largest buildups in history, human history, uh, is what China has conducted over the past three decades. And uh, they now have they always had the largest army. They now have the largest navy. 350-some ships compared to our 292. Uh, and they expect to go well above 400 ships in the next few years. Uh, their shipbuilding capacity, by the way, is over 200 times greater than ours. Think about that. 200 times greater. Um, Xi Jinping has told his, the People's Liberation to modernize by 2027. They want to be the most modern military. That was moved up. My time, it was 2035. And they're really their aim is by 2049, they've told us, is to displace us from the uh, Western Pacific, if not globally, as the uh, top power. Um, that said, look, uh, it's, it's not all about numbers. We still got the best military in the world. We got the best Navy, the best Air Force, the best Army. Uh, and I'll take them on in cyberspace and space as well. But as we continue to kind of mark time, if you will, and they continue to grow, that, that task becomes more and more difficult, which is why it's vitally important that we put the money into our military, uh, that we modernize, and that we tap into the greatest minds in our country, whether it's young entrepreneurs in Austin or Silicon Valley, you name it, uh, university students here in Vanderbilt or other great schools, and tap into those great ideas and continue to stay ahead of the Chinese. That's the challenge we have before us, because I, I guarantee you, I know the Chinese don't suffer from government shutdowns. They don't suffer from, you know, admirals and generals not being confirmed to positions, so forth and so on. And so we have to be a, a, well aware of this, because, as I said in my remarks, uh, a, a strong, capable military, and I would add our allies and partners to buttress a really robust diplomacy. And uh, we are going, we're going to face a very serious period here over the next few years. I was in Taiwan a few months, a few weeks ago. I met with President Tsai and members of her cabinet. Uh, of course, they see on a near daily basis, you have Chinese incursions of both aircraft and ships. You have a lot of threatening language. Um, th there are sanctions on products that the Chinese impose. And of course, the Chinese are very upset about the upcoming election in January of next year because the leading candidate right now, Vice President Lai, He's a, a DPP party member, same party as the current party. They're not happy with him. And so this is, going, this is going to begin a very tense period from January of next year through 2027 when Xi Jinping ends his third term, unprecedented third term, ends. And that was the time where he said to the People's Liberation Army, be prepared to seize Taiwan. So we have a rough going here for the next few years. And uh, we have to do better in, in all domains, economic, military, tech, et cetera, to make sure that we maintain that. At the same time, because I know I've gone on too long to answer your question, you're right. The Chinese economy is in bad straits. Um, their real estate market is uh, faces collapse in many ways. It's uh, it's debt. They have a uh, uh, youth unemployment is over 20 percent. I've been told in Taipei it's probably twice that number. Mm. Um, local governments are struggling to meet make ends meet. Xi Jinping has clamped down on the tech sector. He wants to return the youth to the fields, much as uh, was forced upon him in his youth. And um, things, uh, imports have dropped, exports have dropped. Uh, they seem to be spiraling, uh, not unlike, as some have talked about, and a lot of smart people here in this room, uh, might look like or worse than what happened to Japan in, in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, knowing that stability in China depends, the, the, the tacit agreement between the government and the people is, uh, we'll take care of you economically, you'll continue to grow and prosper, uh, just keep your mouth shut about politics, right? If, if, if the economy breaks, will he be forced to look outside uh, China and do something to keep the people distracted or behind him? And Taiwan could very well be that distraction. So I'd like to talk a little bit about strategy in this context. And uh, the first question um, that comes up in this context, I think you mentioned it already, is the question of allies mm -hmm. and how how um, China's more aggressive stance? We think about you know the activity in South China Sea, but you know a whole variety of other aspects as well. There's this interesting dynamic. I think that of course encourages now other countries 
mm -hmm. perhaps to be more willing coalition partners, whether that's uh, already existing allies, but also question about India, for example, South yeah. Asian countries. Um, how, do you, how do you see that dynamic? Yeah, look, it's a very interesting d dynamic. Let's take a look at both countries. I mean, uh, f first of all, just numbers alone. We have far more and far better allies, right? Pro probably treaty allies alone, I think nearly three dozen, if not more. Russia can count, North Korea, Mali, Iran, <laughs> North Korea. I mean, it it's not a good list, right? I mean, if you had, had to have a hand of cards, you'd want our hand, not theirs. And, and China has no formal allies, but has partners, same, so many of the same partners, right? North Korea. Uh, Russia, so forth and so on. So we, we have a better hand to play. Um, the, the problem, though, where, where you see it is, it does get into Asia, the Indo-Pacific. If you were to go around the rim, you'll see that China is any number of spats with any number of countries. China, uh, China versus Japan, the Sikakus. Of course, they're supporting North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. Work your way around Taiwan. Uh, Hong Kong, which, of course, is now part of China. They broke their one country, two systems pledge. Disputes with the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam on the South China Sea. They've been cutting off trade to Australia. I'm trying to work my way around. I think Cambodia is on good terms with them. Issues with Thailand and, Thailand and the border. Myanmar, I don't see any issues there. They're trying to build a port there. India, though, is the big wild card. I, I've said that China is the greatest strategic threat we face in this country. If that's true, you believe it. I think India is the greatest strategic partnership we need to build this century. And there's a lot to say. I mean, it's the world's largest democracy, a lot of shared values there. And of course, um, not unlike 1962, we had a border skirmish there uh, that still persists in May of 2020 when I was defense secretary, right? Chinese uh, crossed the border, a big fight. Uh, Chinese were hurt, Indians were hurt and killed. And so there's tensions there on that border. So look, uh, a lot of countries are afraid to speak up and afraid to take sides because China will use that economic coercion against them and shut down their economy. If you do the math, I think I, I read where China is the top trade partner and invest, investment partner with over 120 countries in the world. Think about that. And certainly in all of Asia. So um, they're all straddling a, straddling a line. At some point, though, I think they're going to have to start picking sides because you have the economic retrenchment in China. You have more aggressive behavior going on. Uh, that's why I think it's critical that we continue to build uh, our allies and partnerships. I, I do have to say one thing. Um, it's been a mixed bag with our allies. I mean, if you look at NATO, uh, in 2014, NATO allies agreed that they'd all spend 2% of their GDP on defense. Even today, what is it, 11 year, uh, nine years later, right, 2023, only 10, 10 have spent that much on defense. 10 out of 32 and 31 now are spending that much on defense, even in the midst of a hot war in Europe. If you look to Asia, you'll see a better result. Most surprisingly, and Japan made a major decision the last couple of years to double their defense spending from 1% to 2%. That shows you how concerned the Japanese are. And in fact, they went so far as to both alter the interpretation of their constitution, the one we wrote, and to start acquiring offensive Tomahawk cruise missiles. So there's a lot of change going around over there. I think the Japanese really recognize it. And so the, the game is on in terms of competition for allies and partners, certainly in the Indo-Pacific. So I'll have a, a, a question from the audience. I paraphrase a little bit and add one more dimension to it. So um, this has to do with uh, the US posture in the China-Taiwan uh, relations, which of course many believe is if there is a conflict, that would be the trigger. And the, um, you know, the posture has been the notion of strategic ambiguity, mm -hmm. which uh, means effectively that the U.S. has not stated publicly whether it would intervene um, should China invade Taiwan, and U.S. allies in Europe and East Asia have taken a similar approach, or same approach. Now, for me, always, it's like, a, you know, as a, going back to my old days as thinking about game theory, that is like the greatest challenging, you know, interesting concept, because you're adding uncertainty, mm -hmm. right, in order to, be, have a, to, be, to, to have a strategic advantage. Um, but you hear from time to time people say, in the, in the national security and the foreign policy side, now it's time to be more committed. Mm -hmm. It's like that this has served its time, and now it's time to be clear on our commitment to Taiwan. How are you, how are you thinking about that? If I give you my answer, will you give me yours, since you're a <laughs> game theory expert? Yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give you my okay. a little hypothesis, that's all. <laughs> Understanding the relationship between the United States and, and, uh, and, and China on Taiwan requires a lot of study. It's almost like a, a religion. 
in the sense <laughs> if you have to go back to the opening to China in the early 1970s and you have the Shanghai Communique, the Taiwan Relations Act, there are more communiques and assurances, so forth and so on. It's an architecture to build, build up over time. I argued, I've said publicly on many occasions, that the Chinese have violated many of the tenets of that. Simple things like, um, you know, the, our, our long-term view, it's, it's written into the Taiwan Relations Act, that we expect the issue between Taiwan and China to be resolved peacefully, right? Uh, what China's been doing the last several years does not look peaceful to anybody. Um, there would not be any threats of intimidation or coercion, right? Um, so I can kind of go through a list of a couple other things, but I think we've reached a point in time, given the Chinese bad behavior, that I think we need more, uh, we need less ambiguity. I think we need to be very clear that we will stand behind the Taiwanese if, if uh, uh, they are attacked unprovoked by China, right? And uh, Joe Biden has said the same thing four times now, and I've given him credit for that, but he's been very clear. I think it sends a strong message that we will do that. Now, his administration walked it back each time. I don't, I don't really understand that. But I do think more ambiguity is needed now. I think the provision of more arms and services and support to Taiwan is needed now because you have to maintain that balance of power. Power. If you were to go back 20 years, 25 years, it wasn't as much of an issue. Today, it's completely distorted. And I've said this to President Tsai and the Taiwanese. You can't win in a head-to-head -head conventional uh, confrontation with the Chinese. Right? But there are strategies you can pursue, there are weapons you can purchase that you can level the playing field and actually deter them. But I think the Chinese have turned the game inside out. I think some of their actions have violated those fundamental tenets and communiques and so forth and so on to the point that we need to change our game up as well. Very good. And, and what are your thoughts on it? Okay, so uh, just like 10 seconds. Uh, but uh, I think one interesting thing about strategic ambiguity is like one, so there is a, John Lewis Gaddis in his book on grand strategy makes that point, which I thought, always thought was very interesting about the Peloponnesian War, mm -hmm. when, um, you know, Athens committed basically to, uh, to uh, what was Syracuse, I think. And, uh, and once you make a commitment, now you're dependent also on the actions of the other side. So I think one concern has always been if we're fully committed with Taiwan, are we encouraging now Taiwan to more aggressively move towards independence because they know they can rely on the U.S. support? And would that actually make a conflict more likely? So I think that there's this interesting yeah. question about if we're committed, what does this mean now yeah. to the partner we're committed to? And how does this calculus change, which I think yeah. is very interesting. It's very important. It's a critical point. I've, I've made that same uh, uh, view known to both to the Taiwanese and publicly that, look, if we stand behind you, that doesn't mean you can go out and be reckless, right? There's a moral hazard here. Exactly. And, uh, and they can't do that. And my view is, if they did, we shouldn't stand behind them, yeah. right? Because we don't need a war. Nobody needs a war with China. Taiwan doesn't. We don't. The world doesn't. We don't need a great power conflict. It would, it would be devastating. Um, so uh, th there is all that built into it, as you rightly said. I'll be careful with my next question, otherwise I have to have, I'm being interviewed. So uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. I think uh, they you, may want to hear more from you than me. <laughs> the, uh, the, you mentioned Russia, of course. Yeah. And um, I think one aspect there that has been extremely interesting is uh, there's always, nobody quite knows what the calculus was, you know, when Russia decided to invade Ukraine. But I think one part of that probably, or one could imagine, was a, um, you know, maybe overestimating, you mentioned it, mm -hmm. overestimating their own military capacity, mm -hmm. underestimating Ukraine. But I think there also is a question about how the West would react mm -hmm. and whether the, the, whether the Western coalition that has been so critical um, in NATO in supporting Ukraine, once the Russia decided to cut off natural gas, would crumble because of higher energy prices. That didn't happen mm -hmm. or hasn't happened. There have been... Um, of course, discussions, there have been this and that and the other, the usual you know, discussions that happen and mild disagreements among allies, but the coalition has not, has not crumbled. Mm -hmm. um, is that, has Putin miscalculated or is there something that, that we did um, in response to that that made this coalition, coalition more cohesive than, uh, than, than even we thought. Are, well, are, we support, are we surprised too, I guess that's I, my question. Look, at the risk of sounding like I'm defending Putin's logic, I think where he sat in February of 2022 and looked back over time and his assessments and what his generals told him, it looked like a rational decision. Yeah. We really didn't push back much in 08 when he invaded Georgia, in, in 2014 when he invaded, uh, invaded Ukraine. The, the 
Germans and other Europeans didn't turn off the energy. We didn't sanction them, right? Um, and over time, it faded, and, and Ukraine settled into, you know, at that time, a, a conflict. And, I, of course, so there's that. He, he did not think that we would react the way we did, we would respond the way he did. I give the administration credit for that, for kind of bringing everybody together, although there were, there were some missteps, if you recall, before the invasion. You know, there was a question of whether President Biden said, well, if it's a minor incursion, mm. whatever. The, uh, so there was some missignaling there that might have further reinforced Putin at the time, but I think he, I, I think we rose to the occasion. I think the West finally said enough. Uh, I give the administration credit for bringing the allies together, beginning with sanctions on their economy, their financial sector, so forth and so on, um, and, and beginning the supply of arms, javelins, and then stingers. And I have separate criticisms on, on the arms supply, but I, I think, and, and then of course, he, um, he took the word of his generals who overestimated Russian capability and un, under, underestimated. Um, the, the uh, Ukrainians will to fight. And this is where leadership, in, in my view, normally always comes down to leadership. Zelensky showed incredible yeah. uh, bravery, fortitude, and standing there in the breach and not running, not leaving, right? And I think that inspired his people. So um, you know, I often draw the comparison. If you look at Ukraine at the time of its invasion from Russia and Afghanistan when the Taliban came into Kabul, you'll see a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, in Ukraine, the men were, and women, we're heading to the front lines, and their leader was staying in the capital to fight. And in Afghanistan, the leader was leaving with bags of cash, and the men were trying to get on an American aircraft to flee the country. I mean, it's just a, if you look at it from that broad perspective, it shows the, the difference of what that made, and I think Putin underestimated that. And now it's been, a, as I noted, a strategic failure on multiple fronts for Putin, right? He's unified NATO. NATO's grown by two more people. Uh, Ukraine is probably one of the best armed, best fighting machines in Europe right now. Um, he, he's killing the Russian economy, financial, I mean, the, the kind of list goes on and on of strategic failures uh, that, that, uh, that he's brought upon himself, but still he fights. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, but I, I think those calculations, that's kind of how I add them all up. So you mentioned Frederick the Great, and... Uh that, of course, like uh, tempts me to mention another great German military thinker, Clausewitz. Clausewitz, sorry. Who is like in On War, talks about the vulnerability of like, you know, alliances is that the mm -hmm. cohesion of the alliance. Are you worried that, um, that Putin and the Russians are going to learn? Are there, are there particular threats to the alliance? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think Putin is playing a very strategic game. He's seen the West over time where our patience wears thin, we get bored, uh, we don't want to continue to provide the, the money, the means, the armament, so forth and so on. And look, you see that happening right now. You see support in Congress on the Republican side, my side, wavering, right? Putin reads that as good news. He's looking at his watch. He's thinking, boy, the, the U.S. election is 2024. It's, what, 18 months away? I'm doing my math right. Maybe I can wait it out, and we'll see what happens. Or over time, maybe they just won't su support the Ukrainians. Because if the, if, the, if the American aid stops, right, and the American aid now is $113 billion, military, economic, and humanitarian, 45-plus billion um, in military aid, it dwarfs what the Europeans are providing, right? Um, if American aid falls, and I, I don't see where the Ukrainians have a pipeline unless the Poles or somebody else steps up. Germany, unfortunately, has yet to really step up. And most, it's only, you only have a handful of countries, really. I mean, the Baltic states are providing more than the United States is, is in terms of percent of GDP. And then you have other countries like the Poles, uh, the Germans, the Brits. Brits are doing a great job providing. But there's a whole lot of other countries not supporting Ukraine the, the way they need it. So I think, you know, it's like a big Jenga tower, right? We all know that game. Mm -hmm. and, and the United States is that big block at the middle. You pull that out, and I think it falls. And I think that's what Putin's counting on. Because, look, he's... As bad as his economy, his economy is right now, they're still building tanks, 200 a year. They're still mobilizing troops, and he's, he's got his population under control. Uh, they're really good at suffering, and so I think they hang in there because they see this as a, a, a major fight. He's convinced them that the, these are neo-fascists or neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and, and so uh, that's what we're up against is the clocks, right? That's why it's so critical that... Ukraine continue to win on the ground, to have tactical and operational success, because that will drive strategic support from the United States and our allies. So I had a whole bunch of questions related to, I'm going to call it the future of conflict. 
and we talked a little bit a little bit about this when we had time before um, before the event. Um, we had this this uh, conferences now a couple of them on the future of conflict, and one thing that was here at Vanderbilt, wonderful conferences, and one thing, one of the themes, I think that um, were central to both of these discussions, particularly the last one, is that the nature of conflict and the nature of conflict between the great powers is changing. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, there is this is like the reemergence, you know, of, of like a, a big power conflict that we know it from the you know 18th and 19th century. But on the other hand, there are these new elements to it. There are supply chains. Um, the whole, of course, the, the response to um, the invasion in Ukraine was um, uh, sanctions, uh, cutting Russia from SWIFT, which mm -hmm. was uh, you, know, intri you know, unprecedented at this time. Um, so how do, you, how do you think that conflict is changing in, some, in, this, in this world of like interconnected supply chains? Um, I mean, we can, the same thing applies with Russia, with China, of course, semiconductors, yeah. critical, critical materials. Right. How, how should we think about this? So I, I don't see the nature of warfare changing in, in the sense of what inspires nations to do it and leaders to do what they want to do, but certainly the character of warfare is changing. And in, in this context, in Ukraine, it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it, it's a mix of the old and the new, right? You, you have elements of the conflict now that look like World War I. Yep. You know, uh, heavy use of artillery, fighting in trenches, minefields, layered obstacles, so forth and so on, that looks you know, again, like World War One, But then you have the use of, uh, you know, artificial intelligence in some ways, and to me, drones, right? In every conflict, it seems, we want to f pick the technologies that really distinguish themselves, made an impact on the conflict. World War One, it was arguably the machine gun, maybe, maybe the plane, too. World War Two becomes the tank and, and the blitzkrieg. You know, you fast forward the, the, the uh, 1973 Arab Israeli war, it was tow anti tank missiles, right? We're a game changer on the battlefield with tanks. I think for this conflict right now, because we don't know how long this is going to go on, but if, you had, if I had to name the technology that is, has brought the most change in the character of warfare, it is the use of drones. Mm. And the, the use of drones um, as a mass, uh, as, as a weapon system that can be purchased in volume, volume like, uh, I mean, the reports are that the Ukrainians are losing 10,000 drones a month. But they're very cheap, right? So if they only cost a few hundred, a few thousand dollars, so what? But they're using them to conduct what we call ISR, you know, uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. They're using it for targeting on the battlefield, right? If they see uh, tanks in the distance or trench lines, they're using it to call artillery. And they're actually using it in a in direct fire mode where they're, you know, they attach a little grenade. And uh, what's further interesting is they're innovating on the spot, right? They're, they're changing software. They're tinkering in the basements. And, and, and it's, it's just the, the technology is changing. So I think we're seeing a new form of, of warfare out there. And, of course, the United States is building and supplying a lot of these drones itself. And it'll, it'll change, you know, it's changing how we think about conflict as well. I think if you were to go up to Fort Campbell, maybe these folks there, you'll see, you know, drone technology in... When I was Secretary of the Army in 2018, I would go out to the National Training Center, and they were trying to figure out how do they combat drone, uh, the use of drones on the battlefield, because what we had seen the Russians use in 2014 against the Ukrainians, the, the Russians were actually innovating at that point in time. So I think if you were to step back now, compared to other conflicts, it'll be the use of drones that will change the, the character of conflict. And I, I suppose later in this war, and certainly the next one, it'll be artificial intelligence that will improve decision making and accuracy and autonomy and all types of other things in a very, very dramatic way, um, much like but, but, but even better than what we saw in the Gulf War, which became an information age war using precision technology, space-based assets to do reconnaissance and so forth and so on. So I want to come back to AI in a minute. We had lots of interest in that. Mm -hmm. I want to just follow up on one aspect here. So. Um, the there there has been this kind of discussion about like um, the use of like economics, if mm -hmm. you will, um, in conflict. And uh, and one way one way to say this is to say, well, just like you mentioned, I mean, you had the sanctions; they they truly impacted the Russian economy. But they're still building tanks. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have uh, you know Europe is being cut off, you know, from natural gas, and they were able to basically find solutions. And yes. Mm -hmm. There is reduction in economic growth, but we haven't seen the major recessions or anything like that. Right. 
in Europe. So is this kind of, was this a sideshow? Because I think at the time, I think everybody thought, or not everybody, but many people would say, well, that's a different type of conflict using sanctions, global supply chains. Did we overestimate the importance of that? Uh, I, I think many do. Now, I, I've been, uh, you know, working in D.C., I don't know, 25 years or so. I worked on Capitol Hill when we were applying sanctions here and there. I've studied the use of sanctions, and there's probably somebody out here who's an expert on sanctions, so, you know, raise, throw a flag if I get something wrong. But my view is this. Sanctions are most effective when they're multilateral, yep. right? Not, and, and, and even if they are multilateral, they're usually quite porous. And third, uh, over time, nations adapt. And that's been my experience, whether it was, you know, I've seen over time as we've applied sanctions on Iran and North Korea and Cuba, you name it. They ultimately adapt. And look, there are a lot of holes in the current sanctions regime. It sounds good, but individual NATO countries have carved this out and carved that out. And then, the, of course, the big one you mentioned was energy. Sure, they've cut supplies of energy uh, in, in some ways, but China has picked that up, right? China is now buying energy from the Russians. So, uh, so rather than energy moving between Russia and Europe, you know, uh, east to west, it's now moving north and south between Russia and China, right? So anyways, I think they're quite poor, so we overestimate those things. They're, they're good as beginnings. You should do it. Uh, my hope is always that we, we really focus on the technologies as well that will help them or prevent them from rebuilding their military. But even that, again, there are workarounds, and I, I, think, um, I think we can't count on them. They're good. We should use them. They're necessary, but not sufficient. So let's talk about AI. Okay. So um, you mentioned AI. Um, I mean, one aspect of it, of course, that it just dramatically speeds up the ability um, to, to take action. But there also is a question, of course, the fundamental question is like, how comfortable are we to hand over real decision making to artificial intelligence systems? Um, how are you thinking? I mean, how, how are you thinking AI will change the nature of warfare? Well, look, it's, AI is upon us, right? It's happening. We're not going to be able to slow it down. Um, obviously, there's a serious debate underway um, within the community. Um, you know, I, I'm in a venture capital firm. I, I sit on boards, advise companies that are involved in AI. So I see it from that perspective as well. There's a great a lot of opportunity, and, and there are significant downsides as well. So I think the challenge will be is, is what guardrails you put on it, right? And it has to be based on ethics. Um, it, it has to be based on uh, norms of behavior and other things. I mean, there's, you, you, and then there are ways you go about doing it to build the right models, make sure it's ac ac accessing the right databases. But this has been a concern of ours for quite some time. I mean, in 2020, I signed out uh, a document that I reviewed on D, uh, DOD's application of ethical principles, five principles by which AI, DOD would build out its uh, AI programs and so forth and so on. That would guide us. I want to put a marker down, not just for DOD, but for the United States and for our allies and partners and, and for our adversaries as well to say, this is where we're going and kind of set a baseline right before anybody rushed into that vacuum. But we need a lot of work here because there are questions about, you know, is there a man in the loop, a man on the loop, or maybe there isn't somebody in the loop. And there, there are circumstances where one could see that you, you have AI engage automatically. We, in some ways, we use this. Is there any naval, naval officers here? No. Phalanx gun system, right? It's pretty much autonomous. But you're working in a very particular space where there's, there's a, a low probability of accident, if you will, in terms of harming civilians and others. But we have to think through those things. It's not you know, black or white. There, there are, there's a lot of gray in there. And we have to think very carefully about how we apply that, because you don't want to build the tool and then the man in the loop impedes it, but you also don't want to build a tool that can act on its own, and you have uh, really bad outcomes. So I, I think it's going to take a lot of thought, a lot of collaboration between um, industry, between the government, between you know, universities, right? And you guys can be real thought leaders. Vanderbilt can be real thought leaders on this issue because it is a combination of the approach you are taking, this kind of interdisciplinary approach, because it's just not the technology. You've got to have the ethics. So it's it's everything from engineering to ethics here and everything in between, right? Ethics, law, law being, you know, the Geneva Conventions, what are the, what, what are the laws of war, all the way through to, you know, how does this, how, how, how does this operate across the spectrum? So uh, it's a very exciting field. It's very dynamic. It's upon us. And we have to, in some ways, we're playing catch up. Well, Secretary, my last question is kind of continuing that line of thought. We're kind enough to mention the role that universities have played mm -hmm 
uh, in thinking about national defense and Vanderbilt has played. And of course, we're all like uh, reminded of that, you know, when we look, when we watch Oppenheimer, which was like, you know, where like the creme de la creme of like uh, world physics was uh, uh, recruited, you know, to work on the Manhattan Project, which created a whole different way, I think, of how the academy has been part of that, all the way like to how to think about strategy at the time, and uh, and then of course on the technology side as well. Um, what is what is it that universities can uniquely do? I mean, is that how do we harness that tremendous power of innovation in this particular context? Right. Look, it's, it's a very good question. And if you were to look back in history, you will see where universities played a, a very important role. And it's, it's not just on the engineering side. I mean, a lot of our great technologies come out of universities or, or students who, who graduate or leave before they graduate and create great technologies. But so there's the engineering side of the, uh, of the, of, of the issue, right, in terms of you know, who is building the, you know, the arms, the weapons, the materials, all those things that, you know, the uniforms we wear, the, the radios we carry uh, for our, uh, for our uh, soldiers and, and Marines and sailors and airmen and, and guardians. And so there's that aspect of it. But it also has to come, again, with this interdisciplinary approach where you think through what does it mean, right? What are the, uh, what are the ethics behind these things? Uh, what, what are the legal ramifications? You know, when lasers were introduced on the battlefield, it was a few years later when, the, um, you know, the United Nations came up with a protocol about uh, blinding lasers. And so we've we, we got to think through what are the ethics, the ethical application of these systems. And then I said there's the legal, the legal structure, not just the ethical. Um, how does it play into, um, you know, do these technologies bleed into the commercial sector? And how does it change our thinking about warfare? Um, not just at the tactical level, but at the strategic level. So I, I think it, look, it takes a, it does take this interdisciplinary approach to think through the problem and make sure that you're addressing all the right issues and not just the ones you see, but the ones that you know that are out there. And of course, as one of my uh, you know, predecessors said, the unknown unknowns. Unknown you, yeah. yeah, the known knowns, the, un, uh, the, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, right? How do you address those? And I think that's where academia can do that because you also have the virtue of not, not kind of being there on the production line or you're not in the field or on the ship thinking about the technology, but you have kind of the room to think big, to think broadly in ways that others don't. And that's important, right? And that's what, how it ends up in research papers and tomes that you publish and, and that you speak to and that you educate students about. So I think having people thinking about this, and, and, and to me, AI is, you know, it's open ground right now because we do need a lot of thought soon on what this all means and how we approach it. Because like I said, it's changing. It's not just changing warfare, it's changing, it's gonna change how we live. It's gonna change our culture, our way of life, how we do everything in dramatic ways. It's gonna upset economy. It's gonna upset the labor force, both blue collar and white collar, right? That's the issue now. It's playing out today in the, in the writer's strike in Hollywood that was just resolved. It's playing out in the strike in, in Michigan. Uh, all these things are connected, and I think thinking through all those problems is critical because you're going to have AI, and when, particularly when you when you pair AI up with AI up with um, robotics, and you you move into the realm of autonomy, right? Now you're getting in. It, it, it's another dynamic field. So I think what we do need to do is, is stay on par with, or if not ahead of, the engineering, and think through all those other soft science, if you will, applications and considerations and things that that we need to anticipate. Well, Secretary, we've covered everything from Frederick the Great to <laughs> artificial intelligence and everything in between. Great. Thank you so much for this wonderful, enlightening conversation. And we are so delighted that you were with us today. This was our inaugural lecture Great. on modern economy and emerging threats. We couldn't have hoped for better start to it. So thank you for being with us, and thank you for your service. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you all. Thank you. Please join us in the lobby for a reception.